Reverend Genevieve Brown, Associate Minister at In the Upper Room Ministries in Glenwood, Illinois. My name is Karen McGowra. It's a pleasure to be here with you and involved with Julia Alexander's Be Informed of Joliet's Rich Black History. I'm a native Joliet, and it is with great pleasure that I bring to you the rich black history of Will County, especially Joliet, Illinois. Throughout this commentary, I will be using words Negro, Black, and African American because down through the years, the names changed, and in the late 1960s, we became African Americans. Please, Pull up a chair with your family, especially your children, and take this journey with us. At the turn of the 19th century, approximately 20 years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, Negroes first came to Joliet. The planned construction of the locks and of the deep waterway in this area gave impetus to employment, which in turn proved a magnet in attracting workers in this area, including a substantial number of Negroes. The advance of this community, industrially, economically, and culturally, from its early beginning, has been a continued pattern of progress. Negro citizens working and living in this community have kept peace with every advance. From a mere handful of Negroes residing in this area in the early beginning of the 20th century, our race population has grown steadily to the figure of 23,562 people, according to the 2010 census. While every citizen within this community has no doubt contributed somewhat to our total advance, it is to be expected that a strong leadership has made possible the fulfillment of our ideals thus far. It is the purpose of this special feature to recognize and pay tribute to those men, women, organizations, groups, and services that have stood foremost in this historic advance. Contents in this Black History program come from the writings of the late Chestine C. Mason, who was Joliet's first Negro editor, publisher, and author of the Little Brown Book, which was published in 1958. Along with the newspaper writings of Kim Irwin in Joliet Herald News, February 7, 1993. We strongly advise you not to take our word, but to seek for yourself, and you will find many other black historians, maybe, someone in your family. The early history of Will County is filled with great accomplishments of a pioneering people who came, toiled, and established residents that we of their posterity might have the opportunity to expand further the boundaries of so great an advance. It was in the middle of the 19th century that Negroes became attracted to the rumors of job opportunities in Will County. The early construction of the deep waterway and the locks at Lockport, the opening of the coal mines in Bravewood, and the rapidly growing industrial community in Joliet was the magnet of attraction. Mr. and Mrs. Rastus Brown were among the first of the early group to establish residence in Will County in the Lockport area. The Browns came to these parts in 1853. One of their daughters is the mother of Jesse Foster, now Mrs. Jesse Carrington. The Carrington family was the first family to settle in Braidwood to work in the mines in the early 1800s and they resided at 9 DeKalb Street in Joliet, Illinois. Jesse's father was the first Negro policeman to be connected with the Joliet Police Department in 1853. 
It has been mentioned by several historians that Hamlet was the first black to become a Joliet officer. However, there is no record of proof and no one knows Hamlet's first name. However, these men opened the doors for the next group of Joliet and Will County police officers. Among the many was John Holly Abernathy and his son, William Bill Abernathy. The father and son team worked for the Joliet Police Department in the 1950s. And Sidney Shane Edwards became the first black warden of the Joliet Will County Jail in the 1970s. And Sidney was known for carrying a sawed-off, nickel-plated, double-barrel shotgun. Now, among the settlers in the city of Joliet also was Elizabeth Mason Matthews. Her descendants later founded the photography studio that catered primarily to black clientele. We know and knew that studio as Matthews Studio. And it was located at the corner of Pine Street and Western Avenue. We now know that building as the West Pines Hotel. Joseph D. Matthews was the winner of 12 special awards in photography exhibition. Mr. Matthews had recently became one of the 14 Illinois photographers certified by the Illinois Professional Photographers Association. His work then received honorable mention at the state meet held in Springfield. Not only was Joseph Matthews among the first settlers of Joliet and the first black photographer of Joliet, he was the first to open the doors for the present photographers. David White, production studio. Tory McGee, photographer. Cheesing, photography. Wayne McNair, photographer, and Jay Bester, photography. Now for more of Juliet's rich black history. Chestine C. Mason came to Juliet with his parents, the late Reverend J. M. Mason and Ellen T. Mason in 1911. Chestine was a graduate of Juliet Township High School and completed a post course in the field of engineering following his graduation. From 1915 to 1942, he worked as a chief engineer at the Woodruff Hotel in downtown Joliet, what is now the parking lot for the Will County Courthouse. Mason was also employed as a senior clerk interviewer with the Personnel and Industrial Relations Department at the Elwood Ordnance Plant. In 1950, Mason and his wife started the United Publishing Company, and their first publication was The Negro Voice. Serving as associate editor and vice president of the operation company was Beatrice S. Mason. Thank you, Chastine and Beatrice Mason, you paved the way for the late Charles Kane Sr., founder of the Times Weekly newspaper, and now his children carry on the legacy, Jamie, Charles Jr., and Gwen Kane. As we move forward into Joliet Black history, a time of the Civil Rights Movement, this drew concerned pastors, parents, and community leaders together to address the matters of inequality. The call to galvanize by Mrs. Genevieve Range Brown. The late Dr. Singleton got wind of the news and joined Mrs. Range Brown and others in the march on downtown Joliet in the late 1960s and early 1970s for equal rights, job opportunities, fair housing, and fair pay wage. Dr. Singleton marched with the late Dr. Martin Luther King and the Reverend Jesse Jackson in the 1960s and 1970s. 
He also pastored Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church for over 50 years, as well as being a well-known community activist. By this time, blacks set out to gain political power. There were great needs for black educators in Joliet. And a little bit before the Civil Rights Movement in September of 1954, the Joliet Public School District 86 employed their first black teachers. Juanita Kinder was a graduate of the College of St. Francis and she taught at Thompson School on Rowell Avenue in Joliet. Mrs. Ina M. Vonador, a graduate of Jackson College and the University of Illinois she taught at McKinley Park School on Adler Street in Joliet. These women, mighty women, opened the doors and made ways for other great black educators, namely Thelma Kirkland, Mrs. Rubatine Cole, Mrs. Lorraine Cornelius, and the first black Superintendent of District 86, Dr. Louise Coleman. R. Dell Evans sits on the Joyous School Board of District 204. He was elected in 2013. Employed with the Housing Authority of Joliet uh, as the Social Service Coordinator. Later transitioned into being the first Black Self-Sufficiency Coordinator. Genevieve Range Brown, the first Black woman to run for District 86 School Board in 1977. Margie was the first black female from Joliet to run for the U.S. Senate seat. And the fantastic Margie Woods was also a super delegate for the first African American president, President Barack Obama. Margie also campaigned with Mrs. Dew during her election. In addition to Angeline Du, Charles Kane Sr., Harvey Ferguson. My father had a very strong and charming personality. He was able to make a multitude of friends in his community and really across the state. A true people person he was. He was an active member of his church and played a main guitar. I didn't get to see him play often but when he did, it was electrifying. He was extremely goal-oriented and spent a great deal of time planning his next adventures. I was just eight years old when he passed away, and I remember being a daddy's girl. I was so happy to see him and would call him often. I remember calling him when I would get mad at my mom all the time. I would tell him what she did, and he would say, yeah, let me talk to her messing with my baby. To me, it was he was gonna tell her off and she was in big trouble. And boy, did he tell people off. My father made an impact in my decision to pursue nursing. He was in political office in Joliet, Illinois, where he served District 8, a low-income community. He helped many people with housing, health care, jobs, and even family life. Through his dedication, I knew giving to others could be a career and really a total lifestyle. He gained so much through his development into such an influential person for all people. When I was a child, he would always promote education and making sure I get good grades. He would reward that behavior and it really motivated me to be more concerned and more dedicated to my own studies. Who wouldn't want money to pull in good grades, right? <laughs> I often think about how life would have been if he would have lived to see me grow up. Where would he be in life? And what new adventures he would be up for? But in his short time on this earth, he was able to achieve so much and really establish a legacy that can be remembered. Hopefully, his humanitarian spirit will continue to flourish in me to be a better person and hopefully 
a better health care provider so I can build a similar legacy in career and in life. And they paved the way for Herbert Brooks Jr., Denise Winfrey, and Kenneth Harris, who are now serving on the Will County Board. By the way, Herbert Brooks Jr. is the first African American to be the speaker of the Will County Board. Andrew Hinch, oh, a short man with a powerful stature, was the first black to become a city council member for District 5. After Mr. Hinch served on the city council, Warren C. Doris became the representative. Mr. Doris served for many, many years on the city council. Following Mr. Doris came Terry Morris, who represents District 5, and is Susie Barber, who represents District 4. Thank you for your service. As we continue our journey, I would like to introduce to you the first black judge in Will County was Judge Louis K. Fontenot. And he served on the bench from 1971 to 1986. The second black judge in Joliet, Illinois, defense lawyer, Judge Raymond Bolden. Now I would like to introduce you to some of the black owned funeral homes in Joliet, Illinois. I'm not sure which came first, but there was a funeral home by the name of Peoples. L.C. Wesley was the funeral director and he was also a licensed embalmer. Located at 212 South Chicago Street at that time. And then I remember Range Funeral Home. Range Funeral Home was located at 215 South Chicago Street. The proprietor then was Ferdinand Range Sr. Range Funeral Home still doing business after many years under the leadership of Mrs. Willie Range and Ferdinand Range Jr. Also, do you remember Children's Funeral Home? No longer in business now, but he was in business for probably six years. And then we have Minor Morris Funeral Home. Mr. Morris took over the funeral home several years ago, still in operation now. He's adding on a new addition to the funeral home. Congratulations to Mr. Range and Mr. Morris. I would like to introduce to you the Theba Foster Enterprises. Theba D. Foster, real estate broker, insurance broker, and tax consultant, was a graduate of Joliet Township High School and Wilberforce University. He also attended the University of the Philippines at Manila and the John Marshall Law School. Theba qualified as a real estate broker in 1951 and was an insurance broker in 1953. Theba and I had a very close relationship. We were very good friends as well as father-daughter. We would go to the real estate functions together, um, and he and I would dance. I was daddy's girl, and um, I was told when I, at third grade, when we started to write cursive, then I would start working in his office. So on Saturdays, I would go to my piano lessons. Afterwards, I would uh, come down um, Chicago Street back to his office. And my job the rest of the afternoon was to collect the rent from his boarders. He had a boarding house behind the barber shop. And my job was to collect the rent, write them a receipt, 
put the money in the drawer, and that's how I earned my allowance. Now, the early 70s, he decided to relocate, and he bought the property at 1000 Gardner Street. He moved his office over there. At one side, they had a little ice cream shop for a while, and uh, then they depleted that, and then it was just real estate. He also was uh, he also was in the Air Force Reserves and retired as a lieutenant colonel. He would go up to O'Hare Field uh, once a month to teach class. I must have been about 12 years old when in school one of my classmates said we're going to sell our house and move and I said my dad sells houses. So her dad called my dad. My dad told me, you just sold your first house at age 12. Oh, what a thrill. So I would delve into real estate with him. He would take me to show houses. Even um, um, later years, he would send me out to show the house while he did something else. And I, it was nothing for me to take prospective clients out to uh, go out and see a house, show them everything he taught me well. First of all, he started out as a barber and had a barber shop, 128 South Chicago Street, many years. Then he got his real estate license and he became a, a real estate broker. Um, his father, who worked uh, construction, built his office and behind his office, he had a boarding house, boarding, rooming house. I believe there were six, eight, maybe ten rooms back there. And uh, he had rumors. So my job was to collect the rent on Saturdays. Of course, he was out showing houses. I had to be the uh, secretary, cheap labor. And... Uh, Pay the child a little allowance and make her collect the rent. He and some other gentlemen, they formed the Men's Social Club. It was a very uh, distinguished club. Every year at the YMCA, early 60s that I can remember, you would have a debutante show. Now this was in May. And uh, they would take the gym of the YMCA that was on Ottawa Street downtown. They would transform it into a beautiful banquet hall and they would present young ladies. Uh, a 17, 18 years old and here you are, your original debutantes coming out into society. Now here's uh, May 5th, 1966, The Voice uh, newspaper and the debutantes for 1966 have just been presented and their beautiful picture uh, is shown here. Very prestigious, very sophisticated, a beautiful banquet and uh, presenting young ladies. Thank you for incorporating the name of Foster O'Brien into the history of Joliet. In the early 30s and 40s in Joliet, there were several social clubs, one being the Busy Bee Club, which consisted of all women. Uh, this club was organized in 1947 as a saving and social club. In 1950, upon the suggestion of Ms. Lois Anderson, the club included charity in the activities and making it a uh, saving, social, and the charity club. This organization promoted two annual affairs, a queen contest and a fashion show. During the fall months and a raffle and Christmas basket during the Christmas season. Then there was the Assembly Social Club. The Assembly Social Club was organized February 10th 1946 at the home of Ms. Melissa White at 157 South Chicago Street. 
By the way, there were houses on Chicago Street. The club's first president was Ms. Renetta Kaiser. The purpose of this club was to promote social activities among its members and friends. Two outstanding functions are sponsored or were sponsored by that organization. On New Year's Eve, the members entertained their friends at a New Year's ball, and in the spring, an installation ball. The Sojourner Truth Club was organized in 1938 for the purpose of studying Negro history and help further the education of youth. The club had established an annual scholarship of $100 with the Joliet Junior College Scholarship Committee and donated toward tuition of others when the need arose. We've heard so much about the women's social clubs in Joliet. Let's hear something about the men's social club. As a matter of fact, the men's social club of Joliet is one of the oldest social clubs and charity clubs in Joliet and Will County. It was organized in 1948 and the club is active in cultural, educational, charitable, and spiritual affairs within the community. We also have the Beacon Club. The Beacon Social Club of Joliet was organized December 17, 1954 by John M. Borden, temporary chairman. I would like to go back to Ina Mae Bonador for just a moment. She was also the first lady at Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church where her husband, Pastor A.M. Bonador, pastored for many years. Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church was organized in 1909 under the leadership of Reverend T. C. Clements. The church was located at 116 South Chicago Street. It has since moved. The present pastor is Dr. Angelo Hill. Now right around the corner from Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church on Joliet Street, you will find the oldest black church in Joliet which is Second Baptist Church. It was established in 1880 and it is still located in the same spot. And the phone numbers then, believe it or not, this was the telephone number. 309-731. The current pastor of this old landmark church is Pastor Larry B. Tyler. There are some other churches that were formed in the early years in Joliet, one being Mount Zion Full Gospel Tabernacle, organized in 1939. The present property was acquired in 1954 and a new edifice was constructed on North Iowa Street at Crowley Avenue. Pastor Elder Lucy Harvey was the founder of that church, which is now pastored by Craig Burgess Jr. Mount Moraka Missionary Baptist Church, located at 1503 Arthur Avenue, is also one of the oldest churches in Joliet. Mount Moriah was organized on May 30th, 1954 in the home of Brother Theodore B. Cannon at 1527 McKinley Avenue. Brother Luke Cannon called the Reverend James McNear into his home and expressed his grief. Later, the Reverend James McNear would become the next pastor for Mount Moriah. The pastor now is Dr. Clint Wilborn, who is moving it up. Praise God. The late Dr. Singh Pastor Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church for over 15 years. And this is our family, the matriarch of our family, here by my side, Mother Pearl Singleton, 
and all of her children and some of her grandchildren. Uh, to the far left, Isaac Singleton Jr. And uh, behind me, my wife, Charlene Michelle. And here on this side, uh, his grandson, Damien. And then Valerie, his daughter. His granddaughter, Chavez, and his first granddaughter. Notice I didn't say And then his youngest son, Bill Singleton. And we are so honored by uh, the city of Joliet and the school board and the school district for this honor for our father and the head of our family, uh, Isaac Singleton, and we dedicate the Isaac Singleton Elementary School. Thank you so much, Joliet. Thank you. As we continue our journey, I would like to introduce to you Lavinia Gaines Taylor. Lavinia Gaines Taylor came to Joliet in 1963. She retired as the first black principal of Joliet's Cunningham School on May 24, 1989, which happened to be her birthday. After some 33 years of working in education, 26 of those at the Joliet Grade School District. Mrs. Taylor was the first black principal of Fairford Grade School for eight years and the principal of Cunningham for six years. Taylor said she is most proud of instituting four foreign languages, Spanish, French, Polish, and German, as part of the curriculum at Farragut. It was the only school in the district to undertake the multi-language program. After graduating with a bachelor's degree in speech pathology from Illinois State University, she earned her master's degree plus accumulating 40 extra hours in education courses at Governor State University. She was employed as the first black speech pathologist for Easter Seals for five years and as a clinical consultant for the Illinois State University Teacher Education Center for five years. She also taught speech in Madison, Illinois and Bloomington, Illinois, where she was the first black employed. Later, she helped set up a program for Uniroyal for chronic unemployed teaching them basic test-taking skills and reading. Through the Department of Corrections, she conducted seminars for teachers in prison. Mrs. Taylor, now at the young age of 83, still enjoys her life here in Joliet. Let's talk about some of the first female bar owners. We have Rosalind Pauline Goss, who managed Boss City on Chicago Street in the late 60s and early 70s in Joliet, Illinois. How many people remembered Howard's Social Club? We all called it Club 99 on Patterson Road in Joliet. Now known as the Gentleman's Club on Patterson Road in Joliet. Let's talk about a club many of us remember here in Joliet. In the late 60s, early 70s, we have Henry Hammond with Sippin' Easy Lounge located on Cass and Eastern Avenue. He moved to Chicago Street and then after that, on to Patterson Road to a place we are all familiar with, The Legend, where it was previously Dick McGill's Bar. In honor of Henry Hammond, we now have The Legend 2 on Richard Street in Joliet, Illinois, operated by Mike Carruthers. Is anyone familiar with Miss Camille's Variety Club and MG Sport Lounge? It operated from April 2002 to August 2008. Miss Camille's was the first black liquor establishment on Jefferson Street in Joliet. Owners were Andre and Valerie Gaines, Donnie and Karen McAlrath, Troy McAlrath, and Marguerite Sylvia. Congratulations for being operators for the first time for on the west side of Joliet. We need to know about other black contributions right here in the city of Joliet, Illinois. We've named some, we've told you about some, but I just want to rub them off and make sure your children are listening. Dr. William Wilson, Dr. Matthew Withers, Dr. Lucian Holden, Dr. Dovey Harris, Dr. Charles Kennedy, Dr. Marvin Edwards, Phoebe Foster, John Holmes, Attorney Judge Louis 
Fontenot, Attorney Judge Raymond Bolden, Kathleen Bolden, Dr. Louise Bolden, Mrs. Alberta Richie, Angeline Duke, Harvey Ferguson, Andrew Hinch, Margie Wood, David Evans, Frank Stewart, Warren Dark.